Is this what blackberries are now? It's my thumb. <laughs> that's one berry, that's, that ain't right. Maybe it's a snozberry. I always wondered what Willy Wonka was talking about with those. The snozberries taste like snozberries. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Jean McDowell, and welcome to this episode of Bake It Up A Notch. This is part three of our four-part pie spectacular. We are covering all things you need to know to get in the best pie shape of your life in celebration of my upcoming book, The Book on Pie. I'm so excited today because we are talking about one of my favorite kind of pies, fruit pie. At its core, fruit pie is one of the easiest pies out there. It's a little bit of fruit, of course, with sweetener and some kind of thickener to sort of bind it. But there are a lot of things to consider with it. Every piece of fruit is different. Every piece of fruit, whether it's in or out of season, whether you're picking it fresh, whether it's been frozen, there are all kinds of factors and all sorts of things to consider because if even if you have a great recipe, if you don't know what you're looking for, your fruit pies can go awry very easily and you can end up with a big, juicy, soppy mess. We are gonna show you all the tips and tricks to get fruit pies right every single time. Plus, as always, we are gonna show you where things can go wrong and if possible, how to fix it. So if this sounds like something you're interested in, be sure to do me a favor, click like and subscribe on this video so you can be notified when new episodes become available. So let's get baking. There aren't too many pieces of equipment that aren't covered in episode one of our four-part pie spectacular where we covered doughs and crusts. So take a look at that episode for the equipment you're gonna need. The only additional pieces of equipment that can sometimes be helpful when making fruit pies, we're going to be cooking on the stove top. You may need a nice heavy bottomed pot or pan. And sometimes I like to puree my fruit fillings. For that, I might use an immersion blender, a food processor, or a blender. Anything goes. So other than that, all the tools you need are going to be in our first episode of our Pie Spectacular. Check it out. The first thing to think about when you're making a fruit pie is the fruit itself. This is the hardest thing to explain to people who are new to baking pies because they already inherently don't understand the ingredients quite as well. And that's what I'm hoping to get across to everyone today. First of all, think about if the fruit is ripe and in season or firmer and more out of season. It's not necessarily bad to use out of season or firmer fruit to make a pie. In fact, it can just adjust the type of pie that you're making. This is one of the lessons and kind of the main takeaways. You wanna consider your method of preparation based on the kind of fruit you're using. So if the fruit is really, really ripe, you may want to try a different method. I think that one of the most misunderstood things about fruit pies is that many recipes just have you tossing raw fruit with other ingredients, putting it into a shell and baking. And of course that works, it works great. But you can also pre-cook your pie fillings. Out of season or underripe fruit, like. Just by saying that, you might be thinking, well, that's not good fruit. But of course, in many places in the country and all over the world, sometimes you get some fruit and it just isn't the best year, even if it is the right season, or maybe if you're in between seasons, which is where we're at right now. We're kind of just finishing summer, so I can still get peaches, but they're quite firm. They're not, you know, a good, juicy, ripe peach. And then of course, I'm also getting kind of fall produce, like these Concord grapes, and good apples and pears. So when you're in between seasons, that doesn't mean you should stop making pies. It just means you wanna consider the method of preparation. Out of season fruits or fruits that are just firmer, even if they are in season, fruits that are a little less ripe. They have a tendency, of course, to be firmer and less juicy. That sounds bad, but that doesn't always mean they don't have flavor. These fruits can benefit from kind of concentrating their flavors using techniques like grilling or roasting. You can also macerate the fruit to help bring out some of the juices and concentrate them down. But out of season fruit or firmer fruit is also really great for an often forgotten preparation, which are whole fruit pies. You can wrap a whole piece of cored fruit or cleaned fruit trimmed with pie dough and bake it. It's pie at its simplest. So the firmer the fruit is, the more likely it's going to hold up for a longer time in the oven. These are all the kinds of things that you can consider when you're choosing both your method of preparation and the kind of pie you're gonna make 
based on the fruit you're starting with. One of my favorite ways to make a fruit pie is to use a combination of fruits, sort of a blackberry blueberry situation or a strawberry peach. There are tons of options, of course, when you start combining fruits. But when you're mixing up fruits, it can be even harder to determine that juiciness level. So it's something really important to consider. I mentioned before this macerating technique. I first learned about this technique from one of my baking mentors, Rose Levy Barenbaum. She tosses the fruit with some of the sugar or all of the sugar from the recipe and allows some of the juices to come out, then reduces it down. We're gonna talk more about it later, but I bring it up now because it's especially great to do when using a combination of fruits. Because you can macerate the fruits together, those juices are gonna get pulled out by the sugar, then you can reduce them down together and just better control the juiciness of your pies. When you wanna use a combination of fruits, this is also a great time to consider pre-cooked fillings because you can pre-cook the filling either together or separate and control that thickness to exactly where you want it. Plus, with pre-cooked fillings, you can also do different decorating techniques like swirling them together, creating patterns. It's really an opportunity to make your pie extra beautiful and extra special. So when you're thinking about combinations of fruits, just remember that two different kinds of fruits are going to have two different levels of juiciness. You want to control that as best you can up front so that you don't end up with a mess of a pie later. We can't talk about fruit pies without covering one of the most common questions I get asked, which is, what about frozen fruit? It is A-OK -okay to use frozen fruit in a pie, but you do need to consider the overall preparation from starting with frozen fruit to which way you're going to actually prepare your pie filling. There are a few things to consider. First of all, when you use frozen fruit, you do need to thaw the fruit before baking it into a pie. Why? The main reason is because as the fruit thaws, it releases a ton of moisture. If you use frozen fruit in the pie filling, it's going to release that moisture in the oven, therefore making an incredibly soggy pie. If you thaw the fruit, you can control the moisture. You can either reduce the juices that come off of the thawed fruit, or you can just remove them, leaving only the fruit behind. The choice is sort of up to you. I usually opt to reduce the juices because I want all that flavor from the frozen fruit. But you can see a good example here. I have some frozen wild blueberries, which are one of my favorite kinds of blueberries to use to make a blueberry pie. They are so sweet and so juicy, but they're very, very small. Even these tiny, small berries release a hefty amount of juice when thawed. So it's really, really important that you do this step. Don't skip it or you're gonna have a runny pie. After you thaw the fruit, you can either use it in a pre-cooked filling or an uncooked raw filling. If you're using a raw filling, you can either discard these juices, as I mentioned before, or reduce them down to about a third of a cup then add them back to your filling. If you want to use a pre-cooked filling, you wanna start by reducing these juices. You wanna concentrate those flavors before you even begin cooking the rest of the filling. And remember, frozen fruit that's been thawed is going to break down a little bit faster because it's... <laughs> what is it, Brimley? Did he just wink at me? Yeah. <laughs> and back to bed he goes. My dog endlessly entertaining. Um, I don't remember what I was saying. Does anyone else? <laughs> when you're making a pre-cooked filling with thawed frozen fruit, remember that during the thawing, the fruit is going to break down a little bit just inherently. That's what happens when you freeze and thaw the fruit. Some of that moisture comes out, all of those things. So again, that fruit is going to break down quicker in the pot too. So you wanna really think about reducing the juices before adding the fruit back in, or you could end up with sort of a jammier filling. Unless that's what you're going for, which would be delicious too. Even if that happens, you can save it. Just make a jammy filling, it'll be great. Now, that covers your frozen fruit for whether you're using a cooked filling or a raw filling, but also what about freezing the fruit yourself? One of the best ways to have good seasonal fruit year round is to freeze a little when it's good, go to the farm and pick a little, or if you've got a bush out in your yard or a tree, pick the good stuff and freeze the things that are good for freezing. Berries, stone fruit, lots of things freeze great. What I like to do is a method that is formerly called 
IQF, or Individually Quick Frozen. This is sort of a home version, so it's not the appropriate or full way that they would do this if they were doing it industrially. But what you want to do is you want to arrange your fruit in an even layer on a sheet pan. The fruit can be barely touching, but you don't want it touching too much. You put the whole sheet pan into the freezer and freeze the fruit until it is fully, fully, fully frozen. After that point, the fruit can pop off of the sheet tray and be put into a storage container, a, a zip top plastic bag, whatever you prefer. Um, individually quick freezing the fruit kind of helps it maintain its structure and shape a little bit better. So if you are freezing a pie, you can still have nice big chunks if you want them and a little bit more versatility with how you're gonna prepare your final pie. Let's talk about the most common kind of fruit filling, uncooked or raw fruit filling. I may have not said that with as much enthusiasm as I normally talk about things here on Bake It Up A Notch because it's actually one of my least favorite methods. I still use it and I think it's important to talk about how to get the best results, but you're going to see that I get a little more excited about some of the other methods that we're going to discuss that give you a little bit more consistent results. The problem with using raw fruit is that we don't know that juiciness level of the fruit itself. Even if you taste a little bit of it at first, you don't know how much is hiding inside that is gonna come out in the oven. This is an important time to remember some of the scientific elements of some of our ingredients. Sugar is hygroscopic. That means it pulls moisture out of things. And so when you toss sugar with an ingredient like fruit, it starts to pull some of the juices out. If it does that in the oven, you end up with a very soggy, juicy pie. If you take care of it before you put the pie into the oven in some form or another, you'll end up with a more consistent result. I first learned about this technique from one of my baking mentors, Rosalie V. Berenbaum, and she actually has a genius recipe on Food52 that features this method and uses it with great results. Today I'm using it with peaches. Um, you can see if I hold this up a little bit, the peaches have been macerating for several hours. During that time, the sugar has pulled a lot of moisture out of the peaches. During that maceration time, when at the beginning of the maceration time, I tossed it with either a portion of the sugar from the recipe or the entire thing. It sort of depends again on what recipe you're using. I toss it a few times as it sits to kind of redistribute that sugar and make sure that it's touching all of the fruit, getting all of those juices out. Once it's macerated for several hours, it can pull out as much as a cup of liquid. It depends on the recipe and the type of fruit you're using, but really a lot of liquid can come out. We don't want that much liquid in our pie. We wanna reduce that kind of across the board. My magic number is about a third of a cup. Somewhere between a quarter of a cup and a third of a cup is the magic, magic amount. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to strain this peach mixture. I'm just gonna pour it right into a strainer, reserving the juices. I'll save the fruit for later. And if your fruit isn't super delicate, you can actually press pretty firmly to help release some of those juices. We really wanna make sure that we get everything out of there. We want all of those juices to end up in our pie, but we wanna reduce some of the water. What happens by reducing some of the water is we leave just the sweetness of the fruit, the flavor of the fruit behind. We end up with this incredibly flavorful liquid. So what we'll do is we'll take this to the stove top, we'll cook it in a small pot till it's about that amount. If you do this maceration process and you only end up with about a quarter to a third of a cup of liquid, just proceed with your recipe as is using that liquid. But at least you know, you know before you even make the pie, you know before you put it in the oven that you're in control of the liquid situation. You're in control of the filling, you got this. So we put this in a pot, we cook it down, reduce it on the stove top until it gets to the amount that we want it. When it does, it will look sort of like this. It'll be slightly deeper in color and it will be thicker and more syrupy. We wanna make sure that that mixture cools a little bit, but usually tossing it back with the fruit, the fruit itself is cool, it's you know at room temperature. Usually this is such a small amount of liquid that you can kind of toss it right back into it. So now that's one of the reasons that I think 
fruit fillings, raw fruit fillings are so beloved, is they're a little bit easier because now all we have to do is toss our remaining sugar and our starch, whatever our thickening agent is, with the fruit, and then we can add that juicy liquid and any other flavorful ingredients we're adding back in. So I'm just gonna add the sugar. This mixture uses some flour instead of cornstarch. And I'm just gonna toss that until the fruit is evenly coated with both. Of course, you can use a spoon or a spatula for this, but if you haven't been able to tell yet on Bake It Up A Notch, I like to use my hands, guys. You can feel the food, you can feel what's happening. You can see if it's even or if something's going on. All really important good stuff. Also, you might notice because I am doing this with some peaches here that I did not peel my peaches. This is a little Aaron PSA for whoever out there wants it. I don't always peel my fruit. I like the peels. There's a lot of nutrients in there. There's a lot of flavor in there. There's a lot of tartness. And most of all, there is some thickening ability. That skin really can help naturally thicken up a filling. So I like to leave it on. If you don't, totally fine. Peel your fruit, good for you. It's your choice. That's the customizability of pies. I know some people think it's a little tough even after baking, so it's totally up to you. I like the color, I like the flavor, I like what it does, and like I said, there's a lot of nutrients in there too. All right, now our reduced juices go in. Oh my God, that looks so pretty. Get all of them. Scrape like it's your Christmas bonus. Oh yes. So this mixture should look, when it's done, quite gloppy. And that's because the thickener that we're using to help thicken the final pie is not cooked at all. This is completely raw. That's important to remember because people tend to forget the most important step when they are making a raw or uncooked fruit filling. At some point, this mixture has to come to a boil or it's going to taste like starch and it's not going to be thick enough. If it does not come to a boil, an active boil, it's not gonna be thick enough when you slice it. So this is all to say that your fruit pie that's made with an uncooked fruit filling has to, has to, has to show visible signs of bubbling or lots of steam coming through the vents of the top crust. So either way, whether it's a single crust or a lattice and you can see bubbles coming out from it, or whether it's a double crust and maybe there's a little bubble, but lots and lots of steam, then you know that that starch has been activated, it's been cooked, and that pie is going to be as thick as you want it. So that's the simplicity and how to make an uncooked fruit filling. Guys, let's talk about pre-cooked fruit fillings. These are incredibly underrated in my opinion. No one knows enough about these. No one does these. And I don't know why. They make more consistent, reliable fruit pies every single time. And the filling gets a boost of flavor from any kind of cooking that you do that concentrates those flavors. I love a pre-cooked fruit filling. So let's talk about all the different ways you can do it. The most common way to do a pre-cooked fruit filling is on the stove top. What you're gonna do usually is toss the fruit with a little bit of sugar and let it start to break down. This is that same moment that we wanna consider the final texture that we want in our pie. If we want big chunks of fruit and we want nice variants of texture, that's when we're gonna to wanna to consider making sure we don't cook this too long. If we cook it too long, between that initial cook time and the oven time, the fruit might break down a lot more. This is especially important for really tender fruits like berries. Other fruits like cherries, like what I've got here, you know, are a little sturdier and you have to really, really cook for a long time to be able to get them to break down. So you can not worry about lengthier cook times and getting that juiciness level just right. After your fruit has started to break down a little bit with the sugar and is starting to get closer to the consistency that you want, a little bit tender, some of those juices coming out, that's when you're gonna wanna add the thickener. 
What I like to do is stir some of that thickener in with some granulated sugar. The granules of the sugar help break up the cornstarch so that when you add it to the pot, as the sugar dissolves, the cornstarch is evenly dispersed. This is also important because we're going to be adding it to an already hot fruit mixture. So cornstarch dissolves easily in cold liquids, but not as easily once the mixture is hot. And this is my preferred method because I like to get some of that juiciness out before I add the thickener. Once you've added the thickener, you want to cook the mixture until it reaches the thickness that you're looking for. Now this is gonna vary a little bit based on the type of pie you're doing. Remember, double crust fruit pies are gonna bake longer in the oven than single crust fruit pies. So you might wanna cook the filling a little bit more for a single crust, it's not gonna thicken up as much in its bake time. If you add thickener to your mixture and it still isn't thick enough, remember, it's going to thicken more as it cools down and it needs to cool down before you put it into a crust. Putting hot filling of any kind into a crust, unless the recipe specifically specifies to do so, can make the crust a little bit soggy. So I like to make sure we cool the filling completely before we go on. My preferred way to do this quickly is on a baking sheet just like this. I spread out the hot filling into an even layer and that increased surface area helps it cool faster so I don't have to be waiting for hours and hours as it cools in a bowl. But it's important to remember this is another pre-cooked fruit filling and as you can see it's a lot looser than this pre-cooked fruit filling. That's because these are berries. Berries have more juice and I like then a juicier berry pie. So this is one of those times that it's important to remember at the end of the day, pie is still about preference. All your desserts are. Anything you're making at your home, you can customize to make it exactly how you like it. So I like a pie that holds a slice. I like to be able to lift that pie out and not have the filling falling out but I also like there to be a little bit of juiciness. So what you prefer is the right way. There's no one right way to pie, guys. There are so many right ways, and this is just one of them. I will say that I think pre-cooked fillings give you the most reliable result, and they are adjustable. If your filling is a little bit too thin and you were wishing it was thicker even after it cooled, you can stir in a little bit more thickener to the cooled filling and return it to the pot to cook. If your filling is a little bit too thick, you can always thin it down with a little bit of water or flavorful liquid like juice, whatever you want to kind of get it to the right consistency and get a juicier pie back. Once your filling has cooled completely, like this triple berry filling, we can pour it right into our crust. This is going to be a single crust fruit pie with a streusel topping. So I've already par baked and cooled my crust and now I'm adding the pie filling back into the cooled crust. Remember, this filling is going to thicken more in the oven because that starch is going to continue its thickening abilities. What is important to remember is I always talk about how important it is for fruit pies to come to a boil, but when you pre-cook the fruit filling, it comes to a boil before the oven. So in the oven, when it bakes, it may actually have more of a matte effect on the surface than uh, that kind of bubbly, juicy, overflowing sort of look. So it's important to remember, especially when you're making a single crust pie with a pre-cooked fruit filling, that it isn't likely to bubble. Instead, it's going to get kind of an even matte look on the surface, and that's how you know it's done. Okay, so we talked about uncooked fruit fillings and pre-cooked fruit fillings which I obviously favor a little bit, but there is something else to think about. Rules are made to be broken. So you can pre-cook a filling and still get some of that juiciness and that freshness from an uncooked filling. How do you do it? By just stirring some raw fruit into your pre-cooked filling. I like to do this when I'm doing combinations of fruit, but it's also great with fruits that are particularly juicy where you want a little bit of juiciness in that pie. A great example is like a blueberry pie or a cherry pie. This one's gonna be cherry raspberry. And that raspberries are gonna add a little bit of juiciness. They're gonna stay whole and fresh. They're gonna break down into the oven and do all of these you know, juicy oven things that they like to do. And the pre-cooked fruit filling is gonna stay its normal thicked, thicked, thicked? Did I just say thicked? 
it's going to say its normal thickened self. And the juices from the raspberry are just going to kind of juice it up a little bit. So like I said, rules are made to be broken. It doesn't have to be one or the other. In fact, if you want to do a partially pre-cooked filling, it can be both. And you know what's really crazy? It didn't even need thickener. Okay, sorry. I'm ready. I'm ready too. Ready? Right. Oh, this. am I ready? Okay. This is actually one of my favorite types of fillings to talk about because it's pretty unexpected. For this filling, I roasted the fruit. I first came about doing this when I was working on an article for Food 52 on how to make an easy oven jam. Instead of having to cook all of it on the stove top and reduce it down, I did it in the oven. The increased surface area of a baking sheet allows the fruit, the juices of the fruit to kind of spread out and they thicken a lot quicker to kind of this jammy consistency. It's really amazing. So in that sheet pan jam article that I wrote, when the fruit was roasted, it was tender enough that you would just sort of use a potato masher and mash it up and boom, you've got jam. But then one day I was in my kitchen thinking, Boom, I could have pie filling. <laughs> I could have pie filling by roasting it, right? So that's what I did. I gave it a try. And in my new cookbook, the book on pie, I have an amazing roasted strawberry pie and an amazing roasted pineapple pie. But today I made a roasted blueberry pie. And what is so cool about this method is the fruit stays relatively whole and you get that kind of feeling of larger pieces of fruit but the juices inside the fruit reduce in such a way that you usually don't even need to add thickener to the pie. Yes, that's right, no thickener. I can hardly believe it, but it's true. So all that is in this pie is blueberries, sugar, and some flavoring, some lemon zest, some lemon juice, you know, the typical sorts of additional things you would add to make that filling taste so great. So you're gonna see, I'm gonna shake it and on my, overhead camera there, you can see that it's it's firm. It's still got some juiciness to it, but, but it's firm and I didn't add any cornstarch, I didn't add any flour. So I found that the cool thing about using roasting as a method for pie filling, not only is it pretty easy and hands off, but it also pr produces a filling that is really, really concentrated and has this incredible depth of flavor. My assistant Katie, she gave a slice of that roasted strawberry pie to someone and they said it tasted the most strawberry-y of anything they'd ever tasted. And that's how I feel about it. It's this really concentrated, but also this really naturally beautiful consistency. And while we're talking about unexpected cooking methods, another one that you might wanna try is grilling. Grilling fruit can kind of concentrate the flavors and give it a little bit of a char. Then you can just go ahead and chop it and use it in either a pre-cooked or uncooked filling but I love that little boost of flavor that the grilling gives it. And I also like that little bit of smokiness. So remember, it's okay to think outside the box with your fruit fillings and all your pie fillings really, because you might find something unexpected that makes a really great pie. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Crust considerations. These are the things you need to think about when you are making a fruit pie. The most important thing is single crust pies. Single crust pies benefit from par baking. Remember, the general rule is that a single crust pie has less bake time in the oven. So it generally will not get brown sufficiently on the bottom of the crust, and you might end up with a soggy bottom if you don't take care of par baking that crust a little bit before you put your filling in and bake again. Double crust pies, on the other hand, which of course are extremely popular in the fruit pie category and genre, are usually require a longer bake time. And as a result, they usually will bake sufficiently in that amount of time, including the bottom crust, and therefore don't require par baking. I will say again that I like to bake and par bake and really just generally bake pies on a baking steel or a pizza stone. Either one of these is great for ensuring that you get more heat to the bottom of the pie and make sure that it's really browning consistently and evenly and that we don't end up with any soggy bottoms that could ruin our perfect fruit pies. Ah, ah.
One of my favorite subcategories of fruit pies is the upside down fruit pie, the most famous of which would be the tart to tan. I like to make tart to tan or upside down fruit pies with any kind of fruit. This one I have here is pineapple. The way that you make an upside down pie is very different than、uh, a typical pie because there's only crust on. The top, which of course becomes the bottom. So, we're going to invert this pie in just a few moments. This just came out of the oven. You have to unmold it while it's hot, but it is good to give it a few moments to cool because what we've done is we started with sort of a butter and sugar mixture in the pan, and then we added our fruit to that after that sugar began to caramelize a little bit. It makes this sort of yummy caramel sauce, and then the fruit cooks in it. We put the dough on top. That's another thing that's so different about upside down pies is that the dough goes into like a hot pan, which is crazy. And then we bake it until that pastry gets nice and puffy and fluffy and perfect. And then we invert it while it's still warm. And that caramel sort of covers all the fruit. It even runs down the sides a little bit. It is killer, and it's actually an incredibly easy pie to make. No thickeners, no nothing. It's a great dinner party dessert. More people should be making tart to tans. Let's unmold this beauty. It is normal when you unmold a tart to tan sometimes for some of the fruit to either stay stuck in the pan or to just kind of become displaced. I'm a food stylist, so I've got tweezers, but a fork, a little spatula, whatever you got, you can just push your fruit back into its place. And as it cools, the caramel is going to harden and it will kind of re adhere itself to your crust and make this incredibly delicious, beautiful situation. So, the takeaway here upside down fruit pies are incredibly easy. They're really adaptable to just about any type of fruit, and they are so delicious. If you're interested in more about upside down or tart to tan, let me know in the comments. We're considering maybe making some more of these down the line if that would interest our viewers here on Bake It Up a Notch. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go ask my buddy Brimley what he thinks about this upside down pie. But of course, he won't get to sample it. I'll save the sampling for me. <laughs>、so、how can you tell when your fruit pie is done? We've talked about it a little bit throughout with the different cooking methods, but I still wanna put it kind of in a succinct cheater's guide so that you know exactly what you need to know to get it right every single time. If you're working with an uncooked or raw fruit filling, you wanna make sure that that pie bubbles. We wanna see bubbles to know that the thickener is activated. If you're working with a pre cooked fruit filling, it will have a matte, sort of darkened look to the surface, a slightly darker hue than it was when you put the pie into the oven. And another reminder, People ask me a lot about pies browning too quickly. When I make fruit pies, I don't always egg wash the entire pie. If I'm making a single crust pie, I might egg wash the edge. If I'm making a double crust pie, I might only egg wash the top of it because the edges tend to brown enough on their own in that lengthier time in the oven. But if you find that a portion or most of your crust is browning too quickly, remember you're in control of this pie situation. You can tent part of or the entire pie with foil to help it prevent continuing to brown excessively. And you can also reduce the oven temperature. Sometimes your oven is running hot and you might not even know it. So knock the oven temperature down 25 to even 50 degrees for the remainder of bake time. Just remember that when you knock down that temperature, the bake time is gonna be longer. So keep that in mind. Don't take that pie out too soon, or you'll end up with a soggy bottom or maybe even a runny filling. Upside down pies are slightly trickier to determine the doneness because, of course, the fruit itself is out of your view. It's underneath the crust in the pan. So the best factor to look for is a really evenly golden brown crust. If it's only brown at the edges, it's likely not done. Don't take it out until it gets evenly golden or you'll have kind of a doughy bit in the center. The other thing that you can look for with upside down fruit pies is some bubbling around the edges, around the outside where the crust kind of ends. That shows that the caramel underneath is bubbling, it's steaming, and it's a good sign that it's ready to come out. 
So here's the good news about fruit pies. If you follow the guidelines that I gave you in the first part of this episode, you're not gonna have a lot of mistakes. They're actually incredibly forgiving, incredibly delicious, even when you mess them up a little bit or even when they are a little too juicy. You know, they really are just such great pies. They're just such great pies, but there are a few things to think about. So I wouldn't leave you hanging about those mistakes. The first one is right in front of me and it's one of the most common ones. I got a question a lot when my first cookbook came out about one of my favorite pies, my Concord grape pie. It's a delicious pie, really tart, juicy, so delicious, but it is entirely liquid when it is still hot. And that is really true for most fruit pie fillings, if not all of them, actually. It's all of them. All of them are going to be loose when they're hot. So it's really important to let it cool entirely before you serve it. But Erin, I like to eat my pie warm. Understood, I get you. I'm with you on that. We've got a solution for that. But first, here's what I'm talking about. When I shake this pie, you can see from overhead, look how loose this filling is. This is a pre-cooked fruit filling, which is already thicker than a raw fruit filling, and it will continue to thicken up as this pie cools. But for right now, it is absolutely, positively way too warm to cut. If we cut this pie, it will be soup. That doesn't mean the recipe doesn't work. It doesn't mean we baked a bad pie. It just means we have to have a little patience. And I know that that's very difficult, especially when your house smells like pie, but you can make your pies ahead and instead opt to refresh them. I write about this technique of refreshing a lot in my upcoming book, The Book on Pie, but the number one thing to remember is that refreshing is possible both to re-crisp the crust and to gently warm the filling. My general advice when reheating is to start with it, your pie or your slice of pie or your individual pie, whatever you're reheating, gently tented with foil. I like to start that way just in case it browns a little bit too much in the process of reheating. Then you want to take that foil off towards the end of the bake time to help re-crisp that outside edge of the crust to help bring a little bit of the color back into your pie. You can reheat gently at different temperatures. One of my favorite techniques is actually to put it in the oven and start to preheat the oven with the pie in it to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. If you do that, it will sort of gently bring the pie up to temperature as the oven comes to temperature. Then you just usually need a few minutes depending on how big the portion or entire pie, if you're doing an entire pie is. You could need as little as five minutes after preheating and up to maybe 15 or even 20. Just remember, still give it a good five-ish minutes of cool time before you dig in, but because the pie has set completely, it will warm in that time, but it won't necessarily return to this sort Sort of jiggly liquid state. So refreshing your pies is a great opportunity if you love a warm slice of apple pie or any kind of fruit pie, opt for reheating instead of cutting it while it's warm. Now this is one I've already talked about quite a bit in this episode and it's, it's a really important one. This is a uh, raw fruit filling that has been baked. You see we've got kind of a mixture of jamminess and some pieces of whole fruit just by the nature of some of the, that fruit being very soft and juicy and breaking down and some of that fruit being firmer and staying together. But I did not let this pie come to a boil. You can also notice that the outside of this crust is significantly lighter than the crust next to it and that's because it didn't bake quite enough. I like a really dark golden brown crispy flake crunchy crust. I want all those things. So we are cutting into this and we are going to see, oh my gosh, I can ar <laughs> The mistakes happen part, guys, is my like favorite part of this show, but it's also my least favorite. It's all rolled into one because I want to show you because I want you to know what it looks like, but it also breaks my heart when the pie is not what it could be. But don't worry, I'm going to fix this pie and we can still eat this pie. Never fear about that. I had a great question about that on YouTube. No pie is wasted, even mistakes happen pies, not in this kitchen. So I'm cutting into this and you can already see, I basically, it won't even hold a line in the filling from, from where I'm standing. And it just, this filling did not, the thickener did not activate. So even as it sat to cool, it didn't thicken anymore because that thickener didn't fully activate. 
Das ist okay. <lacht> Well, the crust is flaky. I, you can see that. Look how flaky that is. Dang. <lacht> the fruit is not even staying on the slice of pie. Most of it fell back into the pie plate. So again, this would be tasty possibly, but it might also have a noticeable starch taste. I get a comment a lot on my Instagram from people who say, do you have any pie recipes that don't use cornstarch? I hate the way it tastes. I'm sure that there are people out there with incredibly strong palates who can taste cornstarch, but if you use cornstarch effectively, you should not taste it. The only time you should taste it is if you use it improperly, if it doesn't cook out. So if flour, cornstarch, tapioca, whatever starch you're using, They all work, they all work great, but you have to actually get them to the point that they can activate. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with pie that is basically soup. That was gross, wasn't it? <laughs> the last major mistake that I do find people make a lot has to do with those things we were talking about at the very beginning of this episode. Choosing the right preparation method for the type of fruit you're using. Remember, really, really overripe fruit actually works great in a pie, but when it's really, really overripe, it's going to be very soft and very juicy. So sometimes it's best to lean into that, go with kind of a jammier method or, or a pre-cooked filling that you can thicken up and get those flavors in there. Similarly, if a fruit is really firm, I mentioned you might wanna opt for a whole fruit, option like my apple dumpling recipe that's great on Food52. You might also want to opt to cook that fruit in a way that concentrates the flavors that it does have. Because if you have a rock hard peach, there still is juiciness and sugar in there. There's just not as much as in a really juicy, uh, you know, really in season peach. So by grilling it or by roasting it, you can kind of concentrate the flavors that are in there and kind of give them that boost that they need to really still make a good pie. And And then finally, when you've got fruit that's kind of just right, you sort of have your pick of options. You can use a raw, uncooked filling. You can still opt to pre-cook it. You can reduce the juices. You can kind of go any of these routes. Just go with what is going to work best for the fruit, and you're going to end up with the best pie that that fruit could make. I was like, can I lift this whole thing out? No, not yet. <laughs> You're like, no, it's not possible. It's possible, I promise. It's pie-sible. Oh, Let's talk about storing fruit pies because unfortunately fruit pies are one of the most sensitive to store. They really are best when they are made relatively fresh or when they are refreshed fairly soon after being baked. So remember, when you're working with an unbaked pie, they can be held in the refrigerator. You should cover them loosely with plastic wrap so that the dough doesn't dry out. I usually don't like to keep pies, uh, assembled pies like that unbaked in the fridge for any longer than two hours, because again, that sugar is in the filling and it's going to continue to kind of pull moisture out even if you've got a pre-cooked or if you're working with the raw fruit filling, especially then. So no more than two hours in the refrigerator, unbaked, covered loosely with plastic wrap. Once the pies are baked, they are really best stored at room temperature. That's the best opportunity for the crust to stay crisp. So you can just cover them loosely in plastic wrap or even tent them loosely with foil, and they're going to be good for a day or two. As fruit pies sit at room temperature, they will lose a little bit of the crispness of their crust. So remember, they can be refreshed using the methods that I talked about before, which will help to re-crisp the crust, and it'll also give the filling a little bit of a warm boost to kind of get that whole pie back to as close as possible to when it was fresh. Let's talk about decorating your fruit pies. You're gonna find tons of ideas for decorating pies in my new book, The Book on Pie, but I have a few that kind of are particular to fruit pies that are always really fun to discuss. The first one is what's right in front of me, and it's talking about decorative techniques you can do with your crust, specifically your top crust. This is a piece of dough that I rolled out to make the top crust, and I've been taking some little cutouts from it using this little, these are sometimes called pie. 
high stamps because they're not only a cutter, they also have a little plunger that makes an indentation that is really cute and attractive and pretty on the final pie. What I'm doing here is I'm taking some cutouts from, you can see kind of this indentation on the outside of my dough here. What I did was I turned my pie plate upside down and gently pressed it into the dough to make this guide. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a cutout from the top crust of my pie. So I'm gonna take these little snowflake pieces out eventually and then gently unfurl this top crust on top of my pie. This is particularly fun because it's a nice way to kind of show off your fruit filling on the inside because you're gonna take these pieces out and you can see the color of your fruit filling and you can give it some room to bubble over. Plus you can save these little cutouts as decorations for the outer edge of your pie. You can transfer them to another pie. You can bake them as pie scrap snacks and just munch on them. Tons and tons of possibilities there. Another one of my favorite top crust techniques is latticing a pie. I have a great article on Food52 that features tons of different ways to lattice. There are so many more than just one way to lattice, guys. There are so many ways to lattice. I also did a classic lattice on this pie today. Remember, there are both woven and unwoven lattices. So if lattices feel difficult to you, remember you could start with one that's just unwoven. Lay all the strips one direction, then lay more strips another direction. No weaving required. You can also use things like braids and twists, multiple strands of pie dough braided or twisted together as some of your strips in your lattice or even as edges decorative around the outside edge. There are so many possibilities of things you can do to get creative with your dough and the best part is they're all so delicious. My number one tip for using a lattice is to make the strips slightly thicker than you would if you were just doing a top crust or even the bottom crust, which you want to be nice and thin. When you're working with a lattice, you pull the strips back repeatedly, pulling them back, laying them back down. That action of pulling, even if the dough is really nice and chilled, can kind of stretch the dough a little bit. If you want to avoid that stretching, rolling it a little bit thicker helps make that strip, that lattice, a little bit hardier. Plus, who's mad at a little bit more crust on the top of their pie? Not I. The last thing I wanna talk about is garnishing fruit pies. Because remember, you can garnish any kind of pie. You know, people tend to think, oh, I put whipped cream on cream pies, or I put meringue on lemon pie. But you can really do those kinds of garnishes, those finishing techniques on anything you desire. I mentioned earlier that one of my all-time favorite pies is Concord grape pie. So in my new pie book, I have a great Concord grape meringue pie recipe. I think it is so delicious with, oh my God. Look at this meringue. I love you, I think. It's the perfect swoop. It's the perfect, I don't even wanna put it on a pie. I just wanna like marry it on the spatula right here, right now. And forever and ever, they were happy. Oh, it's falling. <laughs> Not happy forever. I'm just gonna put this meringue on the pie. Whenever I put meringue on a pie, don't forget to watch my meringue episode of Bake It Up A Notch if you're thinking, I'm scared of meringue. You don't need to be scared of meringue. There's lots of amazing things about meringue and they are not scary. I like to pile my meringue a little bit more in the center than at the edges. Then I can just kind of swoop it out to the edges while still maintaining that slightly mounded look in the front. So I pile everything in the center and then just kind of gently push from the center down to make kind of sloped sides on the pie. You can also not do this and just spread it in an even layer, but a little bit of a mound is always so beautiful, especially on a meringue pie. It makes it look so towering, so mile high. It's like one of those, it's just one of those things, right? And then of course, if you wanted to, you could torch this meringue because we like fire in this kitchen. But if you don't want to torch it, it's also delicious just like this. Remember, pies are an opportunity to be just as creative with your decorating as you can be with something like layer cakes, pastries, anything. 
there's a ton of fun to be had here. So get creative, find some pictures that inspire you and get baking. You can make any kind of pie, kind of elevate it, take it to the next level with some of these fun decorative techniques. Give it some swoops, give it a nice little dollop on top. Did that look cool? It wasn't. I'm going to smooth it up. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Bake It Up a Notch, where we talked all things fruit pies. I hope this episode arms you to get the most consistent and best fruit pies that you've ever had so that you can be making a lot more fruit pies because you should. You should be making tons of these, especially as we head into fall. And I hope that this episode had tons of information for you. If there's any questions that I did not answer, be sure to leave them in the comments. I'd love to see what you're baking with hashtag bake it up a notch. Be sure to tune in next month for our, the last part of our pie spectacular. We are talking cream, chiffon, and cold set pies. It's going to be a ton of fun. Don't miss it. Until then, happy baking. <laughs>